All right, my name is Rich Schmidt. It's November 24th, 2015. We're here with Dick Ponzi in the Austin Reading Room at Nicholson Library, Linfield College. And Dick, uh, our first question for you is, was there a specific impetus to why wine? Why we why? got in wine? Sure. Well, yeah, I, I mean, it, uh, it, it started out as a very innocent uh, uh, endeavor. We moved up from California, but while we were in California, I was practicing in, as an engineer in aerospace and started to raise a young family, my wife Nancy and I. And uh, um, we thought as an activity that we would uh, try to take the children out and have them experience, you know, these are little toddlers who are uh, always interested in everything. So we decided we would try to uh, take them out and show them what it means to make wine mm -hmm. and to pick grapes and that kind of thing. So we went to a, uh, a local um, uh, grower, there happened to be some Trappist monks who lived in the area in Los Gatos and they had vineyards all over the hills of, uh, of uh, uh, that area and uh, they allowed us to pick grapes and just do the whole thing. So we had picnics up in the vineyards and we harvested the grapes and brought them back to the home and uh, started making wines and um, uh, as every other project usually ends up the kids get bored and they go off and do other things but Nancy and I were left with these vats of grapes that were fermenting and um, and the aromas of this fermentation kind of really hit me because this is what I remembered as a young child our family made wines at home and it was a big ritual and traditional thing to do every fall make wine and uh, and uh, share it with all of the other participating families. So we were the only family, so we were stuck with all this and it, it really hit us, at least me, because of my remembrance of my young days. Uh, this fermenting juice and how wonderful it could turn out and to our surprise it turned out beautifully. Mm. So that was started as a home winemaking operation. Uh, but Beyond that, it, uh, it also, uh, uh, we were living in the country, so we, we always were into gardening and interested in that phase of, uh, of the life. And so we thought, my, this is exciting, you know. And we, at that time, could buy pretty good wines, and because uh, I was an engineer, had properly employed, mm -hmm. and uh, just did all the natural things that you would do. You do tastings, you do experimentation, and you you explore what vintages are available, what mm -hmm. wines are available, and you finally end up educating yourself to the point that you wanted to go beyond just tasting. So, uh, and this was in the 60s, the late 60s, so things were happening in, in the world. Uh, and particularly in the United States, there were a lot of unrest, mm -hmm. and um, we thought that getting closer to to uh, the Earth would be a wonderful uh, environment to raise children in. So <clears throat> we uh, decided that we would explore various areas in California where we could maybe find a plot of land and mm -hmm. grow some grapes. But then we got hooked onto uh, some varieties that we really liked. And Pinot Noir was something that kind of clicked with us because in our experimentations, in our travels to Europe and Burgundy, uh, the wines were so different, the Pinot Noirs were so different from Burgundy from what we experienced in California. So there was a real, missed there and and we realized after a lot of uh, study and questioning um, that the the area of Burgundy was quite different than the Napa Valley. Mm -hmm. uh, there, it was much cooler, much warmer in the valley and maybe that the climatic conditions for Pinot Noir, particularly Pinot Noir, w were not suited in in the areas that we were familiar with in California. So 
that took us beyond California and um, we had experiences with Oregon because Nancy's parents lived in Forest Grove and Gaston and so we would visit on on summers and we would visit in the winters for holidays and uh, really fell in love with Oregon and realized that uh, this might be the place particularly in fact after we had become acquainted with some activity with wine growing in uh, in Oregon and then when we found out in one of these trips that that there was somebody in Forest Grove who was had already had the idea to do something with Pinot Noir particularly mm -hmm. I mean this is a coincidence that I find marvelous that our our preferences in wines were Pinot Noir and here we found somebody who had similar preferences but went a little beyond that in terms of locating an area to grow it and uh, that was Charles Corey and we visited with him on one of our excursions up here and uh, discovered that he had in fact did a lot of research on his own uh, uh, and he had gone to Davis mm -hmm. and that uh, he had done some uh, wonderful research work in terms of uh, wine grapes and putting wine grapes in locations where they would do best historically and also climatically. Mm -hmm. So he did a much more thorough uh, 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 paper on that. And so we got into a discussion on many of our trips and finally um, Nancy and I decided that this would finally be a great place to to do our search and so I would fly up on weekends to look for property and land that might fit in with the parameters that we understood to be good for wine grape particularly cool uh, uh, climate varieties and then once you get into the study of it, you begin to realize why certain grapes are grown in certain locations in Europe as opposed to others. You have Italy, you have France, and you have Germany. So all of these are different uh, uh, climatic conditions mm -hmm. and growing conditions. So that uh, finally we uh, decided that we would make the move and so we got word from Nancy's parents that there happened to be a little house for sale in in the area of Shoals that I knew I mean I remember coming up here and going to the uh, livestock auctions <laughs> and we would drive through this uh, Tualatin Valley area and go over the hills of the Shehalems and go over to McMinnville and uh, I remember the area so well after all the trips well, this little house that was up for sale was located in Shoals, which was right in the heart of the Tualatin Valley. And uh, uh, the house was described to us as a little rectangle, and I knew pretty much the location of it. Uh, but it had one bedroom, and it had a garage, and it had a kitchen, a living room, just pretty much a rectangular lay, uh, uh, floor plan pretty easily and it was a recently built house it may have been four or five years old so we said we'll take it sight unseen but we knew of the area and so we just packed up and at that time I was doing work for Disney uh, designing I came from aerospace to Kitty World and started designing rides for Disneyland and um, I bought the truck a flatbed truck that was uh, available to us and it was propane driven wow that was really ahead of us times and we thought we're going up to the green country and here we have this wonderful propane truck flatbed truck and we sold our house in california and loaded it up with all of our possessions which uh as i tell people there wasn't too much but we had a piano and we had a canoe and we had four barrels of wines that we had made and uh it was like 
you know, uh, if it were a prairie wagon, you know, were drawn by horses, that w this was just a modern day with this flatbed <laughs> propane truck, and we headed up to California, and then Nancy drove in one car, and I drove the propane truck, and we forged it up, and we went up here. <laughs> and so that was the beginning, and uh, I remember the night we arrived, because it was late at night, everybody was tired, and... Uh, we drove up through the driveway to see where our new house looked like, you know, and it was uh, pretty much all that we imagined, nothing more and nothing less. So it was pretty simple, had a wonderful roof on it, simple rectangular floor plan, and uh, we were very pleased with that. So it was a welcome sight to be received uh, uh, after all that long travel. So that's where it all started, and, um, and that was in November of 69. And um, so I was, we were up there, I was with our job, and uh, had big plans, and uh, figured, uh, well, uh, that was November, we celebrated Thanksgiving, and that was, that was fortuitous, you know, and mm -hmm. to arrive on a Thanksgiving day, practically. And then we, um, uh, decided to think about what we were going to do now that we're here. And, well, the first thing was to find some land, and the second thing was to find maybe some work to, to kind of, we had three children then, and um, I had the crazy idea, I don't know whether I've ever told anybody, but I thought, well, as an engineer, something will come up. And so I spent, I remember this so well, I spent maybe three weeks at the library just reading manuals and, um, and literature and waiting for something to kind of strike me as being uh, an interesting project to work on. And so, <clears throat> and then we got to New Year's and uh, we were invited to a neighborhood New Year's party and it turned out that uh, it was at a home of a uh, professor who taught at the community college. And I, I kind of uh, approached him and said, do you suppose there's any kind of work for an instructor, an engineering instructor to teach? And uh, he says, well, there might be. They, they have an engineering department. So, so the day after New Year's, uh, I went down there and uh, inquired at the engineering department if there was any openings and lo and behold someone had resigned over the holidays and there was an opening for an instructor and well, I grabbed it and they grabbed me because they needed an instructor and uh, within a week I was in a classroom <laughs> teaching so that was wonderful. Sure. <laughs> I figured, you know, I'd had the summers off, I could start the vineyard and, and, uh, and then work into whatever would happen. And so that's what happened. So that's why we're here. I guess that's an answer to your question. It's a great answer. It's a great answer. <laughs> I don't know. It raises so many questions. <laughs> Excuse me. So when you're still in California, and you've decided this is what you want to do, where did your confidence come from? How, how did you know this was going to work? Well, uh, it's been a long time before, um, well, let me just start again. There were some other incidences that happened on the way to coming to Oregon. Part of it was making the wine at home and smelling the aromas, but also the memory of making wines at home was not always as I thought back, very successful. I mean, the wines were, it was, making of the wines was one thing, the communal, the communicable, communicative activity of a group getting together making wines, that was a big part of it, sure. the celebration of making wine. But the technical part of it <clears throat> was always um, uh, a mystery to me. I didn't know much about it. I knew how it was made, but I didn't know why or what you did. But the, typically, uh, most of the wines were made to last the year. And they were kept in barrels and they were used over the years. And invariably, by the end of the next season, the wines 
were used for salad dressing. So they weren't very successful. So that kind of gave me a hint that there's more to winemaking than just, uh, you know, mixing up the juice and letting it ferment. Mm -hmm. But <clears throat> on one of our trips to visit, uh, and this is published in Nancy's book, her cookbook, mm -hmm. I mean, we have always been asked, how did you ever get involved with this and why, whatever made you start this? Well. Uh, the search for, for an area was prefaced by a trip that I had made to Iceland, of all places, where I had a, a brother living in Iceland. And he was living in the country, and uh, uh, he uh, always needed to have wine at his dinner table. So in Iceland, obviously, there's no grapes. But he did have, he did some farming. He was an artist, basically. But he did some farming, which meant that he grew a lot of produce for himself. Okay. And uh, he had built a greenhouse in Iceland, which is very uh, wise thing to do because there's a lot of heat, thermal heat that can be used to heat up a greenhouse. So uh, I sent him a roll of polyethylene that he could build himself a greenhouse in Iceland. <laughs> nice. Well, he had a bumper crop of, uh, you know, uh, Iceland is a cool area, so you, you, you look for cool uh, crops to grow. And he had a bumper crop of celery of all things. So what do you do with it? I mean, he didn't have any livestock or anything. So he took the celery and made wine out of it. <laughs> <laughs> Strange story. Strange story. Well, when you make celery wine, celery doesn't have a lot of acid to it. It doesn't have a lot of flavor to it. <laughs> but there's a lot of liquid, sure. right? Well, you. There, there are recipes for all kinds of wines, and you can make wine out of anything. Well, he made it out of celery, and uh, in this little recipe that he had found, uh, he used a modified a recipe for maybe something as silly as wine, as celery, <clears throat> where you add raisins and you add sugar and you add lemons to get the acid, you add sugar to get the sugar, and he made a wine. And one of our trips to Iceland, uh, with all of the fresh fish and uh, wonderful air in the country, he pulled out a bottle of his wine that he made, a white wine. And uh, I didn't know wh what he had used at that time. And we had it with this wonderful fresh fish, a nice white wine, and it was absolutely fantastic. <laughs> now that's in an environment of fresh air, fresh fish, and uh, cool climate, Iceland. And it was uh, just an amazing thing to me that he could do this. He had no experience, he wasn't an engineer, he had no technical skills, but he read a recipe and he made this wine. And so it was just fantastic. I mean, in, this, in the sense that it went well with the food, it was made well, it was clean, and it uh, didn't turn to, uh, to to vinegar, <laughs> so he had some skill in reading and following the directions. So I was amazed, so I said, well, how did you ever come up with this recipe and make this wine? Well, turns out he pulled out a little manual, and this little book was something that I read while I was there. I had to read through this whole thing, and I finally, understood how wines were made and how you can protect wines and how you can avoid wines going bad and what are the things to look at for sanitation. So I basically got a quick lesson in winemaking and I realized what my parents never had done. I mean they just assumed that you squeeze the juice, make the wine and that was it. But the book gave me a, a road map so I was amazed, and that's what prefaced the idea of taking the family up into the tree, up into vineyards in California to um, make wine for the family, knowing now the skills of making wine. 
So um, that's what kind of told me that I could do it. I mean, the wines that we produced in California were just fantastic. They weren't Pinot Noir, but they were uh, of a variety that even the uh, the Jesuits didn't know what they were. They <laughs> called it a uh, they called it early Burgundy. <laughs> well, that that kind of triggered something in my mind, but it wasn't Pinot Noir. Anyway, so <clears throat> that's what that success in making those wines at home um, started the whole thing going. So when you and Nancy and the kids moved up to Oregon, you've uprooted your lives, you've changed careers. What at that point was your definition of success? Well, success was, I mean, that was so far into the future. Um, we were we were pretty young. We were, you know, you might say we were from the the beat generation, and uh, we felt that we were going back to the earth, and we can we can do that, and uh, that I felt that if we didn't succeed at anything, I could always continue teaching, or I have always had a, an ability to get employment as an engineer. That that was my thought. Uh, we sold our house in California, and so we had enough to put a down payment on this little house and also on some property. So uh, the first thing was to find the property, which we found that first year, not too far from the house that we purchased, and uh, that was to be our vineyard. And um, uh, success was, uh, I mean, there were so many challenges on the way how do you plant a vineyard? Well, you know, all of us who came up here during this period were academias. We, we can read a book and we could read directions and we could come up with what to do. Except when you come to farming and you're farming like 20 or 30 acres, that's a little different than hoeing your garden, <laughs> which, uh, which we did in California. and. Uh, but so you had to get a tractor so I bought a tractor that uh, probably looked like a toy today's standards <laughs> and uh, and then we had implements that we had to determine how to use and uh, the whole knowledge of tilling and then staking out a vineyard uh, was all new now during this time I got myself further educated by doing short courses at Davis. That was the only place to get some information. So that was um, uh, a credential that I earned as, as, uh, as a winemaker. But winemaking is also wine growing. Mm -hmm. So the growing was the important part. And that's where uh, having some uh, support a support group up here. Charles Corey was our first contact, uh, other than Richard Summers in uh, in Roseburg. Uh, Richard was really the first to 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 take on this challenge of of wine grapes, mm -hmm. <clears throat> and um, so he had also made acquaintances with Charles Corey at Davis. And, uh, and there was Dave Lett was down at Davis also. So there was some uh, uh, group, loose group at that time, uh, between the three of those and then um, uh, Dick Erath came in and myself and then Adelsheim basically. Okay. So uh, having met with Charles Corey also tied us together with these other people who were coming up pretty much at the same time and maybe a little bit, uh, I think um, Erath came up a little earlier. So that was kind of an interesting thing, I think, for the industry historically to find other people with the same in, uh, ideas and intentions it was a wonderful support for anybody who wanted to get involved in the business if you wanted to take that risk. So we did um, uh, collect ourselves as a small group 
to organize what we thought was going to be. I mean, there was discussions of creating uh, a wine industry because there were a lot of precautions taken in the viticulture part of it. And then there was a lot of uh, collaboration in terms of uh, the winemaking part of it. So we all supported ourselves and we knew that we had to uh, educate ourselves so that we could go out, end up making an, Im an impact on the industry. So to have to ever come to a point where we would reach success it didn't happen for many, many years. Uh, there were hurdles on the way. Success was in success in planting the vineyard. That was one accomplishment. And then to know how to care for the vineyard as it grew were other accomplishments. And then to have harvest, that was a major accomplishment. And to get the ripeness and the anticipation of what the wine was going to be so there were various steps along the way uh, in having any vision of success. Uh, the major success, I think, uh, the, you know, there were uh, five to ten years of a lot of experimentation within our group as to how to process the fruit, how to make the wine, and uh, how to barrel the wine, and and how to market the wine. There, there are so many phases to this business and there are so many important uh, milestones on the way. You know, we had discussions about the spacing of vineyards. Everybody had some input as to how, how you plant a vineyard, the spacing of the plants. <clears throat> and then once, the, once the, the grapes were matured, how do you tend to the vineyard in terms of controlling mildew, if there was mildew? And then there was the, uh, the idea of harvesting. Are we just going to harvest by hand, machinery, or how are we going to deal with it? And uh, uh, the criteria for harvest. And on this way, uh, we always tried to get support from the university, uh, but the university was not always in tune to to what we want because, you know, um, uh, the, the idea of growing wine grapes in Oregon was discounted a few years before we arrived. I and mean, the Uni Extension Service just felt it would not happen <laughs> because they planted the vines on, on the vineyard, on the valley floor, which created problems. Sure. So, uh, I guess to answer your question, there were just a lot of uh, steps on the way to to uh, conquer and to consider success. So I'm going to come back to something there in a second, but I want. But you brought up the group of the early winemakers, and this is something that has really interested us as we've learned more about it. this era is how early on did you decide that you needed to come together as a group versus just handling your own winery independently? Well, I think uh, because we were, we realized we had to learn more than what we knew. Uh, and we all had different experiences. Um, Charles Corey had gone to Alsace and gotten some experience from that. Uh, David Lett was at Davis. Um, I and Nancy would travel to research stations in Europe. <clears throat> While we were looking for land here, we were exploring what we could learn from Europe rather than Davis. And so we would travel to Alsace and we would travel to Burgundy and we'd go to Germany, areas of Germany. These are all cool regions of wine growing regions. So <clears throat> everybody brought what knowledge they had. And when we became acquainted with each other, and I would have to say that uh, uh, and from my experience, Charles Curry was one that I related to a lot, but he also then brought 
influences from Erath, who was, they were partners in nurseries, mm -hmm. so uh, they were interested in selling rootstock and then root material, plant material, and um, so uh, just by the fact that we needed plants, they were growers and with a nursery, and they had some other experiences, we decided that, uh, you know, pretty naive to think that we had to preserve Oregon for wine growing. Mm -hmm. I mean, we really had that, that insight that, because during the same period, Oregon was going through, because of Senate Bill 100, going through a, uh, a land use decisions and we realized that a lot of hillsides were being considered uh, secondary farmland and consequently better for homes. So it seemed like we had all the same mentality to understand that we better do something with the land before it gets uh, developed. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, most of the other winemakers at that time were from Yamhill County. So they had to deal with their county. Uh, Nancy and I were in Washington County, so it's a whole different thing. And so we had to make inputs into the de in decision where the urban growing, grow, uh, the urban growth boundary was to be. And, uh, and because there was a lot of pressure to open up this land to housing and view property, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So I think there was a lot of common um, understanding with those early people in terms of how to use the land and protect the land. And then uh, in preserving uh, the vineyards, the, the plant material, we had an understanding that uh, there are a lot of diseases that can be carried by uh, importing plant material from California that wasn't clean. So we encouraged quarantine on plant material. So there were a lot of issues in growing the, the wines and, and the uh, preservation for future uses. And that was pretty far-sighted, I thought. And it had a collection of people who thought very much alike that these issues would come up and then we could work together to make it happen. Uh, there are a lot of issues in that way that were solved by the group, a small group. And we could, because we had like minds to most degree, we were able to make decisions quickly and then go to the agencies that would give us support. We'd go to the university and get some, try to get some support. We would go to the uh, governmental offices in Washington County or Yamhill County and try to preserve the urban growth boundary and create them such that we could have farmland for future growth. Uh, so uh, I think having a common kind of uh, uh, sense of values in the for the future really bound us together pretty well. We would have monthly meetings. Well, we'd have more frequent meetings, but when the group got larger, we would have pretty structured kinds of meetings at the Tiger, uh, when I was uh, chairman, we had structured meetings at the firehouse in Tiger, and we would everybody would contribute to lecturing or to bringing news to the group as the group got larger. And so I think uh, uh, anybody who wanted to get into the business would find that they would be welcomed mm -hmm. <clears throat> and they would be supported in whatever they wanted to do. So it was like a gang of, bang of gangsters here just <laughs> trying to stick together and working our way through to see this thing grow. And we did want it to grow. It wasn't like we were going off into the corner mm -hmm. and wanted to do things on our own. Because when, once you got into the planting and the making of the wine and having an understanding of that, there's a whole other big issue of marketing the wines. And that was, you know, and uh, 
from day one when you had your your wines in bottles then you had to face the reality that you had to sell it sure <clears throat> and our concept in the beginning was just get close to the market and one of our our criteria for locating ourselves was to get don't get too far away from Portland because mm -hmm. that was going to be our market well it only had two or three great restaurants at the time but we we knew that that they had to have our wines but then uh, once you start getting your volume up you realize you had to go further so the marketing then was another challenge and I think that's where we had to get together to do the marketing and there were some really, really very innovative things that were done because of the ground roots um, uh, endeavor that we were all in. None of us came from wealthy pockets. Um, and so we did much of it ourselves. We did our own farming, we did our own marketing, we did most of everything without hiring someone to do it for you. So that was <clears throat> kind of threw us together as a group to, to, to kind of collect all of our talents and put it to use for everybody to benefit from. Um, so I, uh, I always tell people that it, it was, took us uh, probably the first 15 years to put it all together and putting it all together means you had to you had to know how to grow a, a vineyard you know how to care for the vineyard you know how to make wine how to care for the wine how to bottle the wine and then finally to market your wine and that last phase was probably the most uh, difficult in terms of marketing and being received in the u.s in oregon first then the u.s as a wine region with some quality product mm -hmm. and so convincing people of that was um, probably very difficult in the beginning but again we realized that we had to do it as a group and we're talking by that time maybe a, a 10 or 12 wineries and to do that together was more uh, impressive to the outside world to the wine world because it said well this is not a, just an oddity but it is sure. a group and um, sometimes the wines were fantastic and other times the wines were maybe over glorified <laughs> <laughs> so you had to hit the press and the press was in New York East Coast and that had to be explained to people why where was Oregon and that old joke about being west of the Mississippi <laughs> somewhere out there somewhere <laughs> above California that's right, that's right. below Canada somewhere <laughs> <laughs> so we had some breaks with the press finally and that's really what set it off so yeah. I'm, I'm curious about all within, within the group you have a whole lot of like you said educated um, determined uh, I would say stubborn to appoint people how did the interpersonal dynamics work how were you able to work so efficiently and at the same time keeping um, an eye on your own interests and also like you said the far-sighted the the looking ahead to the future and protecting for the future like, how was that able to be so efficient and what was it, what did it look like on a like a meeting basis like how did how did one look well you know things weren't always uh, we didn't agree on everything sure uh, but as a small group, I think the important issues, the, the um, important issues we pretty much could agree on. I mean, if I were to just take an example, uh, the label regulations. We, we put upon ourselves very stringent label regulations, which at the time, uh, the federal laws were very loose. You could have a red wine and call it Pinot Noir by federal standards if it only had 50 percent Pinot Noir. Mm -hmm. Well we wanted to show that we were truer to the variety by saying a hundred percent and that was a really a far um, more stringent uh, 
regulation that to impose on yourself. But we were looking at quality, looking at being truthful to the consumer. And we pretty much agreed to all of that, except there were some people in other parts of the state that didn't agree with that. They wanted to uh, have it more laxed and not more stringent. So there were some philosophical differences. So there were some having to make some compromises, but these, um, these differences also characterized our intentions. In other words, we, uh, if a group said we'd like to have 100% and someone else said, well, let's just knock it down to 75% as a, as a requirement for labeling, well, that group that was very strong about it became stronger in uniting themselves against the few who didn't want to do that. So that was kind of some of the forces that brought us together is that we pretty much knew what we wanted, but then when there was a small fraction of disagreement, we would unite ourselves more, more uh, strongly to get our way if we could. So that strengthened it, and then when we went out into the public to market the wines, we had to stay this, you know, make the discussions uh, reasonable and also uh, uh, our story had to be pretty much the same. Why are we doing this in Oregon? So we educated ourselves to understand the message and to give that message as a real strong unified uh, story. So consequently we had to get our story straight. We had to hit the press with the same information. And so th that unified us. We were, we were kind of battling the rest of the world so we had to unite our efforts. And I think that happened on a lot of scores. Uh, and um, so we never thought of it as uh, competing with each other because we had the same story to tell the world, the outside world. And so we did tastings together. We would go and, and formulate uh, tastings which would have our wines next to our friends' wines and to our neighbors' wines. <laughs> and they would taste these wines. And we would never knock another winery. We would show ours and point out the benefits and, that, and we marketed that way. Sure. Always with the same story. We're cool climate varieties. This is what Pinot Noir tastes like. And then reinforce that in every market that we went to. So, so within the as your as your your group is growing and you are coming across things like labeling laws and you're coming across things like land use legislation, joint marketing, was it did it seem like it was something that you did because you knew you had to, or, or were there people in the group that had a specific interest and you just happened to get lucky that there was someone who knew about land use legislation? No, I think we. That, I mean, there were some really strong opinions when we heard, for example, that these hillsides are secondary farmlands. Wow, I mean, that's, that's contrary to everything that we were, we were, we believed in because that's why we were here to find the best exposures for, for wine grape growing. And so we had to unite ourselves. We could see the destruction of, of what we, maybe started to just be limited. And I think uh, the timing again was right because it was more than just the wineries, but it was people in the legislature, it was the governor who was advocating this. And so because of the legislation, it really uh, was the support of, of a lot of areas, a lot of people not because of just the wines, but just the fact that, look, there are other uses for this land. Sure. Maybe cherries won't grow here, but look, there's another crop that might grow there. Don't cover it and lose that potential. 
and that reasoning is it go it follows today mm -hmm. you know even when we talk about global warming all that we talk about in terms of grapes could still be useful in the future in use of the land but once you cover it and break it up into little pieces you can't do that so i think there was always a, a strong feeling individually but united we were stronger and we supported a lot of the issues that were happening around that time we were even exchanging information with washington <clears throat> and washington was a much different growing condition in different wine grapes mm -hmm. but they were also a, an industry that was growing um, not initially because of wine grapes but because of juice grapes concords mm. but then they understood that there's also wine grapes that could be grown in that region so we shared a lot of information back and forth based on our regions and how they could be used so um, it it took the insight of individuals first and then and then the collection of support from everybody else to make these things happen yeah so when did you first feel that you could identify yourself as a winemaker yeah uh i always was very cautious about calling myself a winemaker <clears throat> you know i never i never it's uh the the name itself has become kind of a celebratory term because of the growth of the industry and uh, uh, we always call ourselves wine growers because we wanted to gr put together the combination of the growing of the grape and the making of the wine so wine growers was really a new term for a lot of people but it really indicates the importance of growing as well as the making so i would rather use that term <laughs> we were in part of both of those operations sure you had to be yeah so getting back to your to the initial uh move up north um i have to ask what was nancy on board with this was oh this absolutely was yeah absolutely it uh again you know the support is important and this was a uh, you know this was without question this was a decision we both wanted to do and um, and it was you know we were a young family so it was an adventurous thing too and what could we lose we didn't have anything so <laughs> what could we lose <laughs> uh, so um, and you know uh, women were a big part of this uh, wives were a big part of this industry um, in spite of the fact that there were so many divorces but you know it was it was uh, I would say that all of these uh, young wineries had families to deal with and they uh, they they raised families in this world of winemaking and uh, discussing what to do when you start growing grapes and changing discussions with winemaking and wine growing was a big part of the young children's lives and uh, and so you know nancy was definitely it wasn't wasn't my sole idea it was a joint venture uh, I think it you know we we didn't know what we were going to get into we we had we only thought enough to to go from one one day to the next basically but when you start loading up a flatbed truck with all that you own you realize you don't have much anyway <laughs> <laughs> so that was easy to do and uh uh, you had to figure out where to put the kittens and the cats and I mean the dogs and where to put the kids that's about it and just haul up the road <laughs> so
so as you started, as it started to grow, um, did you find that you were sort of consciously defining roles around how the winery slash family was going to operate, or did you kind of settle into that, you, you and Nancy? Well, yeah, we had to, well, the first thing was obviously we got to find an income here, right? So I managed to get the job at the college. That was great. And Nancy uh, ended up doing some yoga, teaching yoga. And uh, the kids were at the age where they could go to school during the day, pretty much, except for Louisa, maybe. But uh, uh, so we supported ourselves that way. And then as, as the farming started, that was pretty much what I had to do. Although once the grapes started growing, Nancy did all the pruning while I was teaching. And, uh, and then the winemaking was always scheduled to be at the peak of harvest, which would always end up on the weekend for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> and that was <laughs> an out of necessity. So we'd pick on Saturday and start fermenting on Sunday and I'd go back to school. <laughs> <laughs> so you mentioned a second ago, you mentioned divorce, and we know this is, industry is rough on, has been rough on a lot of the families of the, of the yes. pioneers. Uh, I'm curious how you made it work. Well, uh, it's, it's really having a good spouse. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great answer. <laughs> yeah. Um, so the last kind of last question. A supporting spouse and one who is forgiving, you know, that's that's important. Definitely, definitely. Um, when the as the history has been written about this and the and the stories have been told, um, it seems like the women are a lot of times left out of the story. Do you have a in your opinion why is that? Why do women... Why are the women in the Oregon wine story kind of left to the side a lot of the times? We, we, we talk about the pioneers of Oregon wine, we, we, the, the women are rarely brought up. Well, in our family, it's always brought up. Uh, well, I don't know. I think uh, it may be because, you know, if you think back, how many couples have survived all this, so they have that support all that time so that you obviously do things together and and I mean the reason Nancy's not here is she's doing something else but um, she has a story too and and you know those uh, those women who were part of that uh, those couples that were part of the beginning all worked together and some survived because I don't know why, but um, uh, you had to be very flexible, obviously, very flexible. We had, we had, a, we all pretty much had families to raise in addition to the, to the labor of the vineyard and the winery. And um, uh, I'm just thinking back to some of the couples that, I mean, they're, there were divorces, but I, I can't imagine, there weren't a lot, like I can think of some of the ones that are still together are still mm -hmm. together. Mm -hmm. But um, probably like any other relationship, uh, uh, you put a little strain on the relationship and you, you don't know if it's going to survive. Sure. Yeah. That's, uh, and it's a small group, you know, if you have two out of five don't succeed in their marriage, that seems like a lot, but sure. now two out of 500 is not <laughs> so bad. <laughs> sure. sure. But it, it's, um, uh, there's a lot of things that would go into it, uh, whether both spouses were keen on the idea, uh, whether both spouses were aware of the difficulties that they might have had. Uh, uh, I don't know. 
You know, I have to tell you that that the first um, we made our first monies in, uh, and it took us uh, about 15 years to make any money in that business. So you had to supplement it with something, sure. a rich uncle or something. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so we just plugged along with it. You know, we did pretty much. I mean, I put tractors together finally to make it work. I built a sprayer to make it work. I built a press. Everything was handmade. And uh, it's, it's much different these days. If you have a little bit of money, you can borrow it and buy equipment and do a lot for you. But I made a lot of the equipment. So that was one way of saving, I guess. Um, but the women also, when we get to the area of marketing, they were very much supportive and they, they carry on pretty much that aspect. And the marketing uh, was by and large by women who gathered together. You know, I think about uh, I, P, and C. They were wives who gotten together along with the, their husbands to form that thing. And that was done out of necessity, you know. I P and C just didn't spring up. It was, it was a uh, an idea that we were having so much resistance in the market to sell Pinot Noir because people didn't understand Pinot Noir. Mm -hmm. It was never made well in California, and when we started making it, it looked like a pale juice that didn't have any um, any character. So we we figured that we had to get some notoriety, some some uh, recognition for the grape. So the International Pinot Noir Celebration was a way to celebrate, not compete. And you know that sounds like an ordinary thing, but you know in those days people were competing. Sure. They were doing uh, tastings and trying to get awards you know, blue ribbons for their wines. And what we were looking for was to celebrate Pinot Noir with other people in the world. And that was a miraculous idea. Well, that came out of, you know, sitting in the, in the back room of Nick's restaurant and talking about how we're gonna promote this thing. <clears throat> and the ideas just flourished and latched onto it. And it was miraculous because it did more than just celebrate Pinot Noir. Uh, and it created a relationship that has been lasting now between France, um, parts of uh, New Zealand to a minor degree, but to other wine regions that we weren't competing mm -hmm. for market. We were trying to expand the market. And so <clears throat> this was a celebration to talk about Pinot Noir with people who have other interests with Pinot Noir. Well, that was pretty miraculous. Everybody else was in California. They were competing for, sure. for medals. Sure. And so that turned out to be fantastic. It, it created a relationship with Burgundy that had never happened before, even with Burgundy. They were amazed that people wanted to get together and talk about <laughs> their wines. And so from that came a lot of things that uh, isn't always realized, but uh, we had a relationship with the young winemakers in Burgundy. Even the older ones couldn't believe what was going on because we were exchanging information we were talking about how to make the wine. And so there was a lot of exchange of information that the Burgundians were little, didn't know, know how to figure that out. <laughs> but with the celebration idea, expanding the market, it brought everybody together. And uh, consequently, we got a lot of help from Burgundy. Uh, some of our plant material now comes from Burgundy. We can exchange things. Our label regulations was very important because 
there were people in the United States making wines, calling sparkling wines champagne. Well, that was an affront to sure. the champagne makers. Sure. And they were calling their wines sauternes. Well, that was an affront to the French, sauternes. So they saw that we in Oregon weren't going to use those terms. Well, they saw that as a wonderful uh, gesture. So we had to get very creative and, and, uh, and uh, uh, innovative, and the women played the big part in that. They were part of that, that celebration, the organization. So a lot of the marketing materials, the, the uh, directories of wineries were created by a, a group of house, uh, a wine spouses. And uh, yeah, there was a lot to de be done by the spouses sure. <laughs> if they could sure. uh, last the, the stress. So speaking of family, uh, did you know or hope that your children would take over the winery? No, oh, that's, you know, a lot of things happened on the way of this journey with the winemaking. And a lot of it was timing and uh, just um, maybe luck and knowing when to do things. And, and the, our children uh, all were raised during this process. Louisa, our winemaker now, was um, two years old when we came up here. And so there's two, four, and six. And all three of them had gone on to school, went off, and did different things. To, uh, to, but they all had different, different interests too. And that's you know that was just came out of their DNAs, I guess. One of them was a scientist majored, you know, and the other one was a journalist, and the other one was a musician who liked technical things, and. Uh, the, the, it, there was an opportunity, they came back to the opportunity. And it was nothing that was forced, nothing that was, it was just, it happened. Magical thing for me, really magical. And an incredible, an incredible coincidence that they all chose interests that would feed together yeah. into the winery when they came. Yeah. And it, it could have been, you know, all of the all of the meetings that we had at home with all the other winemakers, things that went through their brains as we were talking. Who knows? But they, but we, they always knew that we shared wines, that we did tastings together, and we had wines on the table. So, the whole environment of that group was part of their their growing up too. Yeah. So do you hope that it continues into the third generation? Well, see, I, I would play it the same way. No expectations. They're raised in that same environment to some degree, maybe not as close. But, uh, you know, it, uh, it has to come naturally. Well, I think in any profession it has to come naturally. So were you consciously a pioneer? <laughs> I'm, I'm really amused at that term being used so much. <laughs> I really am. I just, uh, when you say pioneer, I'm thinking of the wagons coming across the prairie. Propane truck is close enough. Yeah, that comes pretty close. <laughs> there are a lot of stories in getting that propane truck up here, by the way. <laughs> I can only imagine it going over the Siskiyous. That That's be, right. That, that was a something. big one. That was a tough one. Plus finding your wife and two children on the highway <laughs> because you don't just turn into a service station to get your propane. But any chance I had to get propane, I would turn off the freeway, get propane, and try to catch up with Nancy. <laughs> Whereas she was not to be caught because she was behind me. <laughs> so we lost ourselves on the way up to Portland or to <laughs> Oregon. <laughs> Anyway, but I know that um, you wanted to talk about Corey a little bit. Sure. Um, you mentioned meeting him as like one of the first people you met in in the industry, um, and we've heard lots of things about Charles. So we just I would love to hear your impressions of him. 
Well, um, uh, I remember the first time we had gotten together, and that was at his uh, his house when he was doing a lot of renovation and uh, painting, and uh, just the fact that he was scraping paint off of window frames, I thought that was pretty good. Down to earth kind of a person, <laughs> right? And um, uh, he was very kind. He, um, uh, I don't think that he had uh, joined up with Erath when I met him. He may have discussed it with Erath, I don't know, but anyway. So we didn't talk about plant materials. He just uh, would question me, for example, well, why would you want to do anything like this? And, and I had done some research, so I had the right answers to him, for him. And, uh, and so I think he kind of accepted me as someone who might be uh, serious about what I was going to do. And uh, I always talk about Chuck as being kind of the uh, uh, the visionary, the strong, long view of the issue of the uh, of the industry, and maybe because he did a lot of research on climatology and and understood uh, scientifically in terms of the climate and and the uh, the necessity for certain wine grapes and what was required. So. So he had been educated already, pretty much, on the basics and uh, and the story of uh, of why I would want to do that. He pretty much confirmed, you know, in terms of the cool climate situation, and he wrote papers on it, and uh, and so he had started his vineyard about that time, and so I. Uh, tried to learn what I could from him, aside from doing short courses at Davis just to get caught up. But we shared a lot of uh, experiences in terms of wines. And in fact, I, uh, he, he allowed me to buy a ton or so of grapes because his fruit came on much earlier than mine and I wanted to get some experience. <laughs> um, so he was uh, he was uh, generous enough to sell me grapes. I mean, if you can imagine, you're you're just harvesting fruit and you're going to share it with somebody that you spent years in sure. cultivating the the whole idea. So that was very generous of him. And then, as an organization, um, he um, uh, there was a time in the industry when there was the boys up north and the boys down south as you may recall. Mm -hmm. And the boys down south were people south of Roseburg who, who uh, had a different concept, the vision of the industry. And they were, I thought, were pretty much following the usual Napa Valley kind of thing to do parties around wines and tastings and maybe do competitions and get medals. Whereas the boys up north were a little more serious about looking forward into the industry and what we could do. So the label regulations came out of the north. The you know the um, IPNC came out of the north. So we were a little more conscious of of uh, where the industry might go and how to how to give it support. And I think Chuck was always part of that and. Um, uh, gave us that, uh, that at least to me, that there is uh, something great about being up here in Oregon and what we could do for the industry. <clears throat> and uh, so he supported me when, I, when we broke away from the South with our own wine growers council, uh, and I was the chairman. He supported me in doing uh, sponsoring activities to educate the industry up here. We did uh, vineyard uh, seminars and organized vineyard seminars and organized the meetings and um, and uh, and tigered to to educate people who were coming on into the industry. <clears throat> and he uh, he kind of. Uh, supported that educational part of the of the uh, 
uh, involvement. And I remember one time uh, I suggested that he maybe do some classes at the college in evening classes. And uh, so he, I got a spot for him where he could do a series of inf uh, seminars mm -hmm. in educating people on on uh, why there's the need for wine growing in Oregon, why we're here. And he was concerned about how he could set up his lectures because he was asked to do a, an hour and a half lecture. And he thought, wow, how am I ever going to do an hour and a half lecture? So I said, well, you know, if you schedule it properly, you let your lectures introduce questions from your students and uh, then it makes it a lot easier for you. You give them information that they're interested in finding out more about. And so I think those lectures became very successful over time. And so he was very supportive, always tried to think of ways of promoting the industry. And um, uh, uh, had this kind of far-reaching thought uh, he did have problems, I think, with people because he, uh, if you can imagine uh, people coming to him constantly at his winery and asking questions. And he would get rather annoyed with some people who just were there for gathering information and not in a position of sharing. They, they didn't bring anything. They were kind of drawing things out of him. So he would have a, a temperament and, a, and an attitude that uh, would sometimes turn people off. And I think that was unfortunate because many people didn't get to know him as well as, uh, as they could have. But he understood that there were serious people out there and there were other people just trying to drain your brain. <laughs> <clears throat> so um, then he had some bad times. Unfortunately, he the good times was that he uh, he had um, uh, uh, gotten some recognition from his winemaking in terms of showing his wines at various events in, in Seattle and got some recognition for some great Pinot Noirs. And uh, fortunately, I think out of some of those, people were curious as to what he was doing to get these wonderful wines. And uh, see, there was a time when people were making Pinot Noir and the wines were very light colored. And uh, whenever we were showing our wines, that would always be the first comment. Wow, they aren't really big, bold wines. <laughs> no, they're not. They don't have things blended into them. This is Pinot Noir not Zinfandel mixed with Pinot Noir, mm -hmm. that kind of thing mm -hmm. that a lot of drinkers were accustomed to from California <clears throat> blends. So, uh, so Charles made this uh, wonderful Pinot Noir one year and everybody said, wow, this is a really a beautiful color and uh, pretty opaque, you know, and they thought um, that, that Chuck had some special grapes. Uh, which he said were from Alsace, clone. So his Cory clone became quite noted mm -hmm. because of the fact that he got recognition at a, at a showing and uh, people wanted those grapes. And this is early on, this is uh, late 70s and uh, maybe early 80s, I'm not sure, but there was a time when there, when it, kind of caught people on fire and they thought this is the this is going to be the solution to our problems with color. Sure. But color was never a concern for most of us, but to the to the consumer it made a, a difference. So then the Cory clone became a uh, kind of a sought after clone. Uh, and uh, so he shared that with some people. And then <clears throat> he, uh, I don't know what happened after that, but he took on partners to his winery. And uh, uh, after he took on partners, um, there was um, a growth in his, at his winery, made 
a lot of wines and so at some point uh, he parted with his partners and uh, went on his own basically and and sold his winery to the partners and uh, unfortunately that site has gone through many changes and uh, he has some of the oldest vines in Washington County and it's a beautiful site just absolutely beautiful site and the old house that Chuck worked on is still there and probably renovated over two or three times and then he went off and retired for a, a year and we communicated and he um, uh, spent a lot of time with music I know and and um, and then decided to uh, work in the brewing business. Mm -hmm. So he did some research and started to do a microbrewery, of all things, in Portland. So that kind of excited me to see him getting involved again. So uh, I visited his brewery many times and loaned him a lot of equipment. Uh, I think Erath did too and uh, even a few dollars here and there. But uh, he finally produced the beer, Cartwright Brewing, and uh, bottled it, which was a very daring thing to do, to bottle beer. It's not like bottling wine. It's, um, it not, doesn't have the alcoholic content and the acid. So it takes a, a little more sanitation and care. And so that ended up not being very successful for him. And then he, uh, he and his wife moved to California, back to California, to Calistoga. And uh, I had an opportunity to talk to him on a couple occasions. Uh, and uh, talked to him shortly before he died. But he was um, very instrumental in the beginning, I thought, mm -hmm. at least to me and to uh, a lot of people in terms of ideas. And um, he just wasn't a very successful, I think, in maybe marketing, a little ahead of the times and um, made a lot of wine without having place for the wines to go. <laughs> and so, what happened to Cartwright Brewing then? Well, Cartwright Brewing closed down. It was, uh, it went bankrupt and it was closed. And uh, the thing that happened that was so marvelous is that the community, the retailers, were really supportive because they wanted it to succeed. It's almost like the same people who were wanting the wine industry to succeed also wanted to give support to the brewing industry but it um, it caught my attention <clears throat> i mean after it closed down i i i kind of tried to analyze the problems and why it may have not been successful and um, and then had a kind of a latent interest and then uh, in 84 1984 we we had some dollars from our from the winery that we thought we could um, do something with the brewing business so <laughs> and he did <laughs> uh, just another way you're a pioneer right yeah, yeah, yeah. So why do you think that Chuck is so often left out of sort of the history, the, the story of that time? Yeah, that's a good, uh, interesting question because um, not only Chuck, but I think um, uh, Richard Summers. Mm -hmm. And I think to some extent because they weren't successful enough and didn't have the um, longevity because, um, I mean, I can think of a couple wineries that decided not to continue on and just stop. And it's, it's what keeps me going. 
the minute you disappear, you're lost. But I think Chuck had, uh, uh, yeah, didn't have the longevity. Um, and for whatever reasons, it's, you know, reasons being that he, I think, overproduced beyond his marketing uh, capacity and had partners that he had to take on. And uh, so that kind of uh, had an effect on him. Um, he had certainly support from his wife, no question about it. Shirley was a big part of that business. <clears throat> and uh, he had a great vineyard site. And uh, I think it was just the having the funding to continue the, uh, the size of the winery. I think it was growth that went too fast. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I can understand that a little bit because I can remember times when I thought, how are we ever going to sell all this wine? <laughs> you know, we're talking only a few hundred cases. He had everything invested in it. Mm -hmm. And if you didn't sell it, you wouldn't have funds to continue on. Sure. So at that point, I think you either take on partners to bring in capital, or you try to expand your sales in a way that, uh, that you can move the wine. So that's, those are all the components of success in this business, uh, even to this day. Mm -hmm. I'll have to tell you that uh, the easiest part of the business is making the wine. And the, the hardest part is to get the recognition, the, the consistency, and the, uh, the ability then to continue the flow. It's very important. Mm -hmm. So even with, with the 400 and some wineries we have, that's, uh, that's uh, uh, a big job to maintain the industry with just local sales. The wines have to go out nationally, internationally mm -hmm. to, to sustain this industry. And um, that's a, true today. It can't, be, it can't be sustained on just small wineries. I mean, there are, there are examples of that. I could, uh, we, you know, when we were looking at where to move our, our where to start our vineyard, we went as far north as Okanagan Valley in Canada. And, uh, and that's still, today, that's a good site for Pinot Noir and Pinot Gris, pretty much what we're doing. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but the marketing hasn't expanded very much up there, so consequently the industry is smaller. So it's more localized, regional, rather than international. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> because the wineries are small and they they seem to uh, uh, not have any well it seems to me from the outside that they're not growing to levels of uh, supplying the international market where Oregon can do that but it takes that marketing ability to make it happen so I think, in Chuck's case, I think that the marketing wasn't there and the volume um, was too large to handle at the time. So is Oregon still a small industry? It's, um, it's, a, uh, it's, it's small in comparison to other regions of, like California. Uh, it's uh, small in comparison maybe to uh, places like Australia, uh, comparable to New Zealand, uh, comparable to, to Burgundy, except of the, if you're talking about revenues, Burgundy exceeds Oregon, but if you talk about volume uh, of acreage, I think we're getting we're approaching that level. Uh, Pinot Noir is is a, a wonderful grape because it requires a very specific area to grow in, and that's been proven. We've proved that, and so there aren't 
you can't grow it in every region of the world, wine regions even. It's, it's site specific. So consequently, is, there's always going to be a demand for, I think, Pinot Noir because it's site specific and there aren't too many of those sites in the world. And that's a blessing, you know, sure. in terms of competition sure. and maintaining an industry. Yeah, I think Oregon definitely is, is, can sustain itself, no question. Uh, there have been so many predictions that that we've uh, that we've uh, overcome. Do you know what we've always heard is, uh, will these wine age mm -hmm. as an excuse for mm -hmm. we're not going to buy them because they won't age, or you can't grow enough, your yields are too low to make it profitable, and. Um, there are all of these reasons, but they've all been pretty much discounted, I think. And uh, what I do think we need is to have more wineries marketing in the world. Because if you can only buy these wines here, it's, it's limits its, uh, its importance in the world scene. So. so on that note, as you go from, you're, you, you're talking about a, a, wine, a wine industry that's 10 or 12 wineries back in the day to now 680 or whatever the last number we heard was, um, wh what does the industry feel like? Uh, the, you have a lot of, do you still have that kind of camaraderie that you used to have? Yeah, I think so, uh, to a great degree, to those wineries that are participating. Mm -hmm. That's the issue. The wineries that are participating and not, you know, if it's 600, it's hard to get 600 people to agree. Sure. But um, those who are, are looking to the future and looking to uh, making Oregon of greater importance, I think there is cooperation and there are some wonderful people coming in now who are joining in that um, that uh, collection of uh, of uh, joining together to to promote the industry as a whole? Uh, and I've watched new people come in, and I've watched how they enter in, and they <coughs> aren't quite sure how to respond to things. Mm -hmm. They don't know if they're competing or if they're supporting or if they <laughs> should support. Sure. It's a, but those who come in and in, in support of the industry, it's amazing how the talent that's available. Sometimes the talent um, duplicates things that were done in the early days that didn't work and want to try it again. Like there's some winemakers these days that want to bring Riesling back into the Vogue. Mm -hmm. And and I say, wow, you know, we did that 40 years ago. <laughs> well, they're making some nice Rieslings now. Okay, now how are you going to market that? Well, we've got a bigger marketing arm. we got more people out there. Oh, maybe it'll work then. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, there's new talent coming in, which is great. And there's new talent that uh, is interested in Pinot Noir to some extent. I mean, there's some talent that come in, they don't know why they're here, except they hear us at a wine industry, so they want to start a winery. Uh -huh. It's a little bit of the history of California and Napa Valley, but, <clears throat> and, um, but things that are changing are, you know, uh, things that are bound to change and that's land values are changing uh, uh, but there are a lot of things here that are available marketing is available now there's the notoriety is there uh, we know more about growing grapes and learning still how to grow grapes even in winemaking there's still experiments going on among winemakers and that's still going on um, 
So it's uh, new talent and uh, I think the right kinds of people by large that are coming in. But it, it is still, to some degree, uh, possible for a young couple to come in and plant a little vineyard and make some wine and sell it and uh, make a, maybe a comfortable or medium comfortable life and maybe grow into a larger winery. Uh, so all of these components have to work, you know, the winemaking, the wine growing, the making, and the selling. Mm -hmm. If you hit on all those, I think there's still an opportunity, sure. So where do you think Oregon, the industry, is headed? Well, I think it's, it's, uh, I think it's headed uh, to be larger in terms of total volume, because there's, I mean, we mapped out the valley and uh, we haven't even come close to filling these hillsides. <clears throat> but um, so volume wise, I think we'll grow, become a little more popular uh, nationally uh, and it'll grow to some extent internationally. Uh, probably the wines will cost a little bit more because the land is more expensive now our yields aren't any bigger, you know, mm -hmm. so the mm -hmm. cost of grapes per acre is more. Mm -hmm. uh, so the cost is going to go up. So that's going to be somewhat limiting uh, into the market, how much market you can penetrate. California, if you look at a warm region and what a warm region can do, they can make a lot of a lot of wine inexpensively even though the land value is expensive mm -hmm. but I think Oregon will always be a I think a premium wine region and it has to be noted that way it, I know that when we first started making wines and priced our wines people thought they were very expensive compared to what mm -hmm. well compared to jugs mm -hmm. you know gallons of wine and we had to educate people that these were not jugs wines, these were premium wines, so you had to find your market. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it's still going to be that somewhat premium market. Otherwise, it's not economical. Sure. Yeah. How have you seen that change in your years in the industry in terms of consumer education and consumer willingness to spend a little more on fine wine? I think it's, I think it's been accepted more uh, because we're looking at that market that is able to afford the wines. I mean, if we sold a $20 bottle of Pinot Noir back in, in the 80s or 70s, that would be too expensive. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I think our Pinots were like seven fifty a bottle. And people thought that was expensive. <laughs> now we're 10 times that. <laughs> so, but I think we're marketing to the right class and the people who are buying it understand the value of the wine. I, I see some prices of our wines, I can't even afford them. And if, if I'm on the East Coast, it's an amazing thing. What they do to the pricing, they really, so it's, uh, I, I think we're going to be limited because of the economics to some degree. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm amazed that we can produce a wine at $20 a bottle of Pinot Noir. It's, uh, it's a little bit profitable, but <laughs> <laughs> you have to do a lot of it. So what about the future of Ponzi then? What about the future of the Ponzi winery? Well, I think uh, we're always reaching for the best, you know, and trying to make the best. What we do is, I mean, is we try to create the most exotic wine, the most precious wine that we can make out of the 200 and some acres that we have 
and then just call down to pick out you know maybe a thousand cases of the very 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 best mm -hmm. and then work down to that to the lower levels so we're always reaching for the stars and uh, settle with what we can to keep that standard high but what that means is everything below that is still going to be pretty good mm -hmm. that's the point but you know you like to create the the best possible Pinot Noir that you can imagine <laughs> so I'm curious uh, what is the California industry's um, opinion, attitude of, of Oregon and Oregon wine? Well, it depends on who you talk to. Um, you know, in the, in the last 10 years, we, we would go to California to various um, Pinot Noir seminars where Pinot Noirs were being offered by anybody who produced it in the United States. And... Um, First of all, Oregon was really dominating those tastings. Maybe 20 of our wineries would go down to five or six California ones. And mm -hmm. Now it's just flip-flopped and California completely outproduces Oregon. Hmm. <clears throat> They've expanded more, more areas where they grow Pinot Noir, but typically the styles are quite different. Um, you can't duplicate Oregon weather. <laughs> <laughs> it's, and it's something we don't want duplicated because it's pretty unique. Sure. So, so we have that uniqueness that um, the same as the Burgundy has their uniqueness and California has their uniqueness depending on where the wines are from. But um, I have to say that in the beginning again with these small groups of winemakers we had there was also a small group of california winemakers who were very passionate and serious about pinot noir mm -hmm. and we got together with them too along with some burgundy winemakers and anybody else who made pinot noir and to this day we're still having an exchange <laughs> from anybody who makes pinot noir in the effort to learn more about the grape and the winemaking. So those, to those people, uh, they look to, to Oregon like another Pinot Noir area. Mm -hmm. uh, and Burgundy looks to Oregon as another Pinot Noir area. So there is still that, that camaraderie between Pinot Noir producers who are serious about making the best and exchanging ideas so uh, to those people in California back in the late 70s and 80s um, uh, they still understand what's happening here and we understand what's happening down there so there's a lot of um, respect for each other for sure so you mentioned in one of the past interviews we listened to that California was one of your best markets. Is that still true? Are you still selling a lot of wine in California? Yeah, California and New York are the best. Um, in fact, we just looked at some of those figures. Um, Cal Northern California pretty much. Well, Southern California is catching up too. Yeah, that's uh, our best markets in Chicago and Texas. <laughs> I have to imagine that's kind of a thrill to see your your wine in a New York restaurant or a Chicago restaurant. Yeah, it's a, it's a thrill, but it's really, wow, where do they get those prices? <laughs> <laughs> it's unbelievable. Uh, the <clears throat> uh, the thrill is really to uh, to have it anywhere on a list that uh, to have a Pinot Noir list to start with. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, I mean, that was one of the things we kind of tried to promote sure. to restaurants when we were pitching it. You, know, you should have Pinot Noirs on your list. Just generally, any Pinot Noir, please <laughs> put a Pinot Noir on there and then it will grow. And that's, that's really what's happened, yeah. 
Pinot Noir is becoming pretty popular on good wine lists. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what's the best bottle of wine you've ever had? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll tell you, uh, uh, there are a couple of our wines that I really reflect back to because either from historical reasons, but also from a quality standpoint. Um, and my daughter would say something different because she's made wines for over 20 years herself. Sure. So she has as much history as I do. <clears throat> and her wines will probably turn out much better than mine. But uh, in the dinking around that we did back in the 70s, I would say that a 79 was one of the most exciting wines for me because it lasted so long and got paler and paler in color every decade I tried it. <laughs> but it still had the strength and the subtlety of, of what Pinot Noir really is about. So I'd always look at that as kind of a benchmark. And uh, then the other one was 85, because 85 was a breakthrough for us in the industry. Mm -hmm. Now, some other wineries may have other vintages like 83, but 85 was, the, was uh, finally getting recognition from the writers Mm -hmm. and particularly Parker. Mm -hmm. When Parker tasted the 85, he thought they were, wow, these are like closest thing to Burgundy. And so that really, you know, I can't emphasize how the marketing is so important to this industry and to have the writers write about it. Even to this day, it goes on and on. If you don't have the support of the writers, you, nobody knows about your wines except on the internet, maybe. Hmm. But that one drew an attention of a writer who was very popular at that time, who could make a difference and made a big difference, and came out here and invested in property, and um, also um, conducted a seminar with Oregon wines and Burgundy wines together and uh, had a nice ev evaluation of the wine. So that made a big impact on the industry in 80. Now that would have been in 86 or so that he did that tasting. But it was on the 85 wines. So you, you mentioned earlier when you, when you were talking about your, your brother and the, the celery wine and the kind of the context of that wine. I'm curious as a consumer of wine, or as a, as a drinker of wine, how important is context to you when you're drinking? The context? The, con the context, like the, 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 the situation uh, where you're drinking it in, you know, you're talking about oh, the fresh yeah. fish and the fresh air. Very important. The easiest way to sell a wine is to bring someone to your winery. Mm -hmm. I mean, everything tastes better to them there <laughs> <laughs> because it's the personality of the people. Sure. The personality of the winemaker, the impassion that displayed and um, but you know there's, there was uh, uh, I can remember this uh, so well because we, we always brought people into the vineyard or into the winery to taste the wines mm -hmm. distributors um, uh, merchants to taste the wines and invariably there'd be people coming every year to taste your wines, the same people. Mm -hmm. And you could, taste, you could test them on it because all of our wines come from different, vintage, different vineyards. Mm -hmm. So the barrel may be of one vineyard, another barrel is of another vineyard. And <clears throat> there is a, a winery, a vineyard that we have that is very, I think, very unique. It's only like two and a half acres or two, two acres. And it always goes into a barrel of its own, a couple barrels. And when you bring in these people to taste, um, I would have this one distributor of ours from Washington, D.C., one of the first distributors to represent an Oregon wine, was a real, and with a palate that was very keen. Mm -hmm. And 
he proved himself over and over. We'd go through all the barrels and bingo, we'd hit the spun barrel that came from the vineyard and he would snap at it. He would know it. Just, he'd have that memory and the wine was that unique that he could say, this is Abatina. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah, and he was, well, he's still alive, but unfortunately he had a stroke. Mm. And he was a brilliant guy. He was like Charles Corey in a sense. Tremendous memory, um, a very difficult person to work with because he was never on time, very uh, boisterous, and uh, people were always kind of cuddling away from him because he didn't know if he'd attack you or something sure. with something. But he was bright. and. Whenever, and he handled our wines and a lot of Oregon wines. And whenever we went to sell the wines at the restaurants, we would start like at eight o'clock at night to go to the restaurant to sell the wine. And we would end up midnight selling wines to the sommeliers and to the restaurants. I mean, he was absolutely nerve wracking because that's when he did his best work keep you waiting all day long and then you jump in his car, a rattly old car, <laughs> and go to these fancy Washington DC restaurants in the middle of the night. <laughs> I knew I was in for hell. <laughs> well, it's, oh, it's nice that you brought Charles Corey up because I have one more question about him. Yeah. I'm gonna put you on the spot a little bit with this one. We'd we'll, we'll love to have your take on the Charles Corey, David Lett timeline. Who, who did what first that is sort of the industry can't really seem to, to, to decide on. To do what, oh, to. Who, who did what first in the in Oh, the Pinot Noir yeah. business? Yes. Well, I think that's unfortunate that it's come to that kind of a thing because it's so insignificant in the grand thing of it all. Mm -hmm. And the best that I can figure out, <laughs> I mean, the history keeps being repeated and, and uh, described differently. It seems to me that, uh, is it a dispute? Whatever you want to call it. It's like, who planted a vineyard and who planted in the ground first. Two different things, right? Mm -hmm. I think that's the issue. And this, what I know in terms of timing, I don't know, okay, first of all, who planted first? Well, someone planted in a nursery row and somebody planted in a vineyard, months apart from each other. Mm -hmm four or five months apart, I think, is what I'm reading now. What I know is that Chuck Corey went, after graduating from, high, from college, went to Elsass to do a stage, to get some experience, okay? David Lett visited Corey in Elsass during that time. David Lett came back and did something planted a nursery row, or maybe uh, maybe started a vineyard, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Charles Corey was in Alsace, and when he came back after that year, he planted his vineyard. You know, that, that was a few months apart from each other is not, I say, wait a minute, what about the guy down south? <laughs> huh? Richard Summers is the man mm -hmm. that all of them knew at Davis. They knew of him. Mm -hmm. He's the guy that planted Pinot Noir first in Oregon. Okay, you could say that Chuck planted in Washington County first and Dave Lett planted in Yamhill County first. I think you're pretty safe with that one. Mm -hmm. But between the two of them, uh, it's insignificant, in my opinion. 
We planted in 70. <laughs> <laughs> but at the, I think that's unfortunate that that issue keeps coming up. And the other issue, well, yeah, everybody contributes to this industry in one form or another. And it's ideas that, that I think we were, at one point we were trying to figure out how did the IPNC really come up? Who came up with that idea? Okay, well, if you have a group of people talking, ideas are flying around. Mm -hmm. You come out of the meeting and you decide that you want to do this IPNC. That's how it happened. Mm -hmm. You're discussing, how are we going to market this wine? How are we going to get attention? And it may have happened over one or two meetings, you know, casual meetings and discussions. But to find the fine out, finite timing of it all is hard to do. It's because of the mind of people attending these meetings and discussions remember their contribution and therefore that was the beginning of it, that kind of thing. It's the, it's the follow through that's very important. And the follow through was a group of people coming together. And you may eliminate one or two persons out of that group, but everybody sees it a little differently. Mm -hmm. The brewing in the brewing industry, we're kind of getting some of the same stuff now. Uh, and I, uh, we had a discussion about why is the, I mean, this is getting Ray off the issue, but it just is a reflection of people's memories and how they see things happening. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that I say to people about the brewery, uh, brewing industry is that the reason we have so many breweries that are uh, functioning is not because they're breweries, it's because they're brew pubs they can sell what they brew out of their place. And that came about because we changed the law. And who changed the law? So you go through that history and you say, well, how did this all happen? And that's a phenomenal story in itself. And, and I'm sure you've, you've seen the, the film on it. But the inside story was, yeah, there was a group of us who went down to the legislature to loosen up the brewing uh, laws. Mm -hmm. And I always use the argument, it's like wineries. If you give us a, a ability to have a tasting room, this industry will grow. And it did. Mm -hmm. So when we went down to the legislature, that's the same argument that I gave. You've got to allow breweries to have a tasting room. Let them brew and taste in their facility. So there was a lot of resistance with not the legislators, except one or two, but the distributors, they fought it and fought it. Mm -hmm. So there was one bill passed through the House, didn't make it through the Senate because a couple of leg uh, senators killed the bill. So we thought we were lost. So then we went down again and we talked to another senator and the senator said, well, listen, I've got a bill that went through the House and went through the Senate. All you have to do is take your brew pub bill and tag it on. <laughs> and it did, got tagged on to a bill that was passed by both the House and the Senate, had nothing to do with breweries except um, it had something to do with uh, bed and breakfast. So the bill was put on there and it went to conference committee to put it into the bill. Nobody was there who objected to it and it passed. <laughs> so it became law. Here we had the lobbyists uh, who were fighting it. The distributors were fighting it. Uh, some of the senators thought that we were coors in disguise with a bill. So that, that was, you know, we didn't know what was happening, but it went through and it was. So everybody has a different recollection of why the bill went through. 
but that's the story. <laughs> <laughs> and it worked out great for the distributors in the oh, end. I mean, yeah. the industry has, bull, has blown up, so they, exactly. they ended up winning anyway. They did. Yeah. They did. That's amazing. Yeah. And, and the senators who thought we were a, a Coors bill finally realized that it wasn't a Coors bill at all. So, interesting little details that can, are kind of, I mean, uh, uh, things happen, you know, quirky way, kind of the right timing and the right people involved. And uh, it's amazing how it happens. And sometimes it never happens because those things don't come together. Sure. Do you think that the wine industry would have succeeded if it hadn't, if it had been a different group of people? Do you think it, do you think it's possible it could have failed if it hadn't been the right group of people that started it? Uh, I think we needed the numbers of people. We had to have a, 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 a collection to show that, that it was possible by a group rather than just one person doing something. So it would have been, it would have been difficult to be a loner and do it. Mm -hmm. uh, a different group of people, I think we kind of um, uh, gelled into a common understanding. Some of us maybe thought we could sell it on our own. And there were some, there was a winery thought that they could do it alone, mm -hmm. but finally had to join in. And, uh, you know, some people think they're more clever than other people. <laughs> sure, sure. So once they, they hit the brick wall, then they kind of fit into the group. So I think uh, if we had a different group, I think that it, if they hadn't gelled like we did, it, I don't think it would have been nearly as successful. I think, you know, maybe I'm looking at it from a distance, but I, I look at the Okanagan Valley because we almost settled there. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that they're quite as unified as we are. The, the last time I was up there, they were wineries and restaurants kind of working together. Not, not together, but individually. Mm -hmm. Everybody had their restaurant, everybody had their winery, and uh, they were winery restaurants. Mm. And uh, I don't know, they probably have an association, but maybe it's not as uh, uh, far reaching in terms of what they want to do. So I think, it, it, yeah, a lot of things came together that worked, fortunately. Yeah. But there are a lot of ideas that came out of this group because of communicating with each other and looking at different options. Really? Yeah, it's a pretty unique, it's an interesting story. It's a great story. It's a great story. Great story. You know, it's, it's overcoming hardship, right? Mm -hmm. And now everybody's driving around with their fancy cars, right? <laughs> <laughs> we did a, we did a, well, we had a salud tasting at our place and all these wineries are there. And, uh, and so, well, there were 25 of the, of the I think there were 20 or 45, no, 25, I think, winery contributing. And uh, the one comment that we got after the event, criticism, was that there weren't enough, there wasn't a Tesla charging station for the wineries. <laughs> <laughs> That's a sign of success. And if, if not, that's, that's a sign. <laughs> you know, you got to have a Tesla charging station. Oh, hadn't thought of that part. <laughs> Something for the next tasting room to have. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> that's awesome. So anyway, yeah, times have changed for a lot of wineries, fortunately. Do you still have the truck? You still have the propane truck somewhere? No, we, we got rid of it. Uh, how did we get rid of it? I think, I think to another farmer, a young farmer who wanted to be green. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's all the questions we have. That's all the, that's all the stories all the I stories have. have. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much for, for okay. sitting down. This has been great. And we'll go ahead and stop recording now.